Coffee Talk. Everyone joining us, we have a distinguished guest here today, uh, Chief Dave Hoffman of the Lawrence, Indiana Police Department. I'm Jason Domkowski, the Director of Law Enforcement Relations for Body Worn by Utility and a retired Chief of Police from West Lafayette, Indiana, home to Purdue University. Welcome, Chief Hoffman, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the uh, the mug that you sent in, uh, in honor of this uh, wonderful event. And I must say, I you, you just look too young to be retired. I, that, I'll just get it out there. <laughs> well, with three kids in college, I'm not quite uh, retired. I did do yeah. 25 years in law enforcement. And uh, for everybody watching, there is life after law enforcement. But until you get there, uh, we need to talk about body worn cameras, but a very, very important question before we get started to lay credibility uh, to both uh, our guest and myself, uh, Chief Hoffman. Yes, sir. How do you take your coffee? How do you take it? Well, I'll tell you a little secret here. I'm not a big coffee drinker, to be honest with you. So I don't know if you can hear that or not, but there's actually ice jingling around in there. And this is iced tea. So I take my iced tea sweetened. So I don't know where to start on that. Um, um, most, and I know you spent a, a number of years at the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department before you were appointed to, to Lawrence, Indiana, uh, Chief of Police. But I'm assuming you worked a shift or two of, of Midnight Patrol. I sure did. I was. I, I think it was documented. I was the only late shift police officer in Indianapolis that did not drink coffee. <laughs> so I don't know if that's something to be proud of or not, uh, if that's what you're known for. But uh, yeah, I, I took a lot of grief for that in my uh, late shift uh, years of my career. We're going to roll with it. And, uh, you know, uh, Chief, at the end of the day, uh, you do have uh, time and grade on, on a lot of places uh, in a lot of uh, situations that I think maybe will lend to uh, some insight here today with body-worn cameras. You, you guys were a, an extremely early adopter of body-worn cameras in Indiana, but also um, the first adopter of body-worn by utility in the state of Indiana, going back four or five years ago now. Um, the question I have on that is, uh, if anybody can, can reflect a little bit, how about some unintended benefits of the body worn solution for your agency since you've adopted it uh, as you've been chief? Um, we could talk all day long about the benefits of just uh, body worn cameras in general, uh, but what, what set utility apart was the software side of things. Um, I liked how uh, we could log onto this website and see the location in real time of all of our resources, whether those are human beings, police officers, or whether they uh, are the vehicles that they drive. And uh, an unintended benefit, something I hadn't really even thought about, was the fact that in Lawrence, we have a 911 communication center. And we have a dedicated screen, uh, a big 60 inch flat screen that is dedicated to a veil web. So when our officers are engaged in a pursuit or something, some critical incident, our dispatchers don't have to worry and wonder where the officers are at if it's a high stress situation. And we've had countless examples of officers who uh, you know, needed help from communications in setting up a perimeter and uh, determining where they were. Sometimes you know, a foot chase could go through alleys and backyards and, and you could easily get disoriented, especially at night. And the dispatchers were able to see or are able to see that little green dot that represents the most important asset of our agency and that is our people and they can tell other officers where that officer is located behind an address, for example, or, or whatever the case may be. So that was a big one. And another one from an investigative standpoint um, that we hadn't even thought about was the impact on domestic violence, um, uh, arrests and convictions. And as you know, in the state of Indiana, we have uh, an exception to the hearsay rule in court called excited utterances. And excited utterances are the things that domestic violence victims say in the heat of the moment when the officers are first arriving. They could be statements that are incriminating against what just happened 
in a domestic violence incident. And our body-worn cameras, thanks to utility, are capturing those excited utterances. Detectives are able to log on to the, to the avail web, view the videos, and really put together very solid probable cause affidavits for that support the arrests of domestic violence offenders based on these excited utterances. Chief, you're kind of underscoring um, a feature there that is, you have the confidence, I guess, to know that every domestic violence call that your officers go on or, or whatever other calls that you have determined that you want to have video of, the automation piece, the policy interaction yes. uh, between the cameras and, and I'm assuming the policy is in, in Lawrence, uh, Indiana, that you want the cameras to come on for all domestic violence calls. And can you talk about how, how that works and how you're able to, uh, I guess, sleep a little easier at night to know that you'll always have that video? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. This is a policy-based um, product so that what we do in Lawrence may not match what other communities or other police departments do. We have a fairly uh, robust policy, I think, in that we have decided that every interaction that police officers have with our citizens, whether it's an arrest or whether it's giving somebody directions, it doesn't matter. Whenever they are interacting with other people, they are to be recording. Now, that may sound like a really stringent um, expectation, but because of the automation, because of what I call, I think what you refer to as CAD activation, whenever an officer is, is logged on to a call for service in the computer-aided dispatch system, their cameras automatically come on. And you can hear it because on the, on the microphones for the officers that, that have their microphones turned up, you can hear the announcement dispatch recording. And that, tells, that reminds the officer that their camera has now come on and it, uh, it, it records everything from the, from the time the officer gets put out on, gets what we call put out on a run. Um, and then um, it remains active until the officer makes the conscious decision to turn it off. And what we like about that, or what I like particularly, is that when an officer is out in the community on patrol and they get sent on a run in the cab, the camera automatically comes on. So number one, they don't have to think about it. And number two, from whatever point that is until the officer arrives at the location of the run or the call for service, from point A to point B, that's all recorded. And we know that uh, a lot of things can happen from point A to point B, especially when officers are uh, operating their vehicles under emergency conditions. And for those officers, I don't have one on right now, but for the officers who wear a shoulder mic, right up here, anything that's being said on the radio is also being caught on the camera. So we can hear the updates that the officer hears and uh, it, it's all caught on, on the video as well. We don't have to overlay different uh, sources of audio and video, it's all captured uh, on one recording. Chief, you guys are kind of famous there in Lawrence. I know uh, for a lot of people watching, they'll, they'll have seen your agency for uh, several years now on live PD. Sure. And the activation of the body camera is audible. I've, uh, you know, my, my sons watch this program uh, incessantly, uh, and they'll they'll know that when Lawrence, Indiana, is on, an officer will answer that that call for service with their their uh, mobile radio in the car, and it'll automatically you'll hear recording. And I'll point out, hey, that's our system. Uh, that's, that's, right. that's body uh, the, the automation yeah. of answering the call with the CAD service. And you guys have really displayed that for the whole country. Um, but can you can you give some examples on, uh, on your body worn ecosystem and how that's played out on camera on Live PD? Yeah. So um, first of all, I should mention Live PD um, at the height of their popularity last year, uh, they were the number one rated cable television program in the United States. And on some weekends, on some weekends, depending on uh, the, uh, the NCAA uh, football schedule, on some weekends, it was the number one rated pro television program in the United States. And we were proud to be on there. It was, uh, for those that don't know, Live PD was a show where it's essentially, it's a live ride along in real time 
with camera people. It's not like other television programs that are edited, um, you know, um, and and produced for entertainment. This is real live. It was a kind of a network news kind of a show. You have three different anchors and uh, eight different police departments that were riding along in real time. So, and yes, I mean, we had, uh, I think they said the average viewership was 2 million uh, viewers on Friday and Saturday nights between 9 p.m. and midnight. And a lot of those viewers are police officers and police chiefs because they like to see what's going on at other par other places in the country and law enforcement. So I did. I fielded a lot of phone calls from chief, uh, chiefs and sheriffs and uh, superintendents asking me, what is this, what was that dispatch recording thing I heard uh, when I saw it on Live PD? And uh, so uh, I was able to explain uh, exactly how the system worked. And uh, you asked for uh, specific examples. I, I, there are so many. Um, right, and right. I'll tell you one of the, one of the most exciting and, and uh, uh, gosh, life-threatening incidents was a gentleman who was uh, suicidal uh, standing on some railroad tracks in front of an oncoming train. And that train was moving. Uh, Lawrence, Indiana is known for being a, a thoroughfare for um, for, for trains. Our, our city's really cut in half by a, uh, a multi-track route that runs from Buffalo to St. Louis. So, um, and we're, we're right in the middle. So we, we get lots of trains. And uh, this gentleman was, he was um, very intent on ending his own life by train. And when our officers confronted him, first of all, they had to run about a half a mile to get to him. And they had to get to him before the speeding oncoming train. And all of this was caught on video. And just at the absolute last minute, uh, our officers were able to, two of our officers were able to get this guy off, off the tracks and pull him to safety just as the train was coming through um, with, its, with its horn, you know, just blaring. You know, the, the train operator obviously saw what was going on and he was honking his horn at this guy. And obviously those trains can't stop. They're doing 40, 50 miles an hour and it, it takes forever for trains to stop, as you know. So that was one exciting uh, video that I was actually able to play for uh, our uh, Merit Commission members, which that's a civilian oversight board that controls hiring and, and discipline and those kinds of things. And I played that video for them and uh, they were astounded. And I actually, I, I issued awards, performance awards in front of our Merit Commission based on that video. Um, other examples, uh, you know, if, if you ever watched Live PD, you, you got to see uh, vehicle chases, you got to see funny interactions between our officers. And we had one officer who's a really good dancer. He's got like a million TikTok followers. It's insane. Uh, but uh, he was on a traffic stop with a group of, this is a white officer and an African-American female driver and three small children in this car. And these, these girls, and I would say they were ages between, you know, seven and 10 probably. And they recognized the officer and they said, hey, you're the dancing cop. And he said, yeah. And he, he challenged him to a dance off, right? A little dance competition alongside of the road. And uh, these girls just had an absolutely wonderful time uh, challenging this officer to be a better dancer. And they were all, you know, really good little dancers on their own right. And there, so there we were on a national stage <laughs> and the officer, the, the race relations, the common sense, the good judgment, the, the wonderful police community interaction that occurred with that traffic stop. And you know, wisely, he, he did not issue a ticket to the driver. It was a minor offense that turned into one of the best um, uh, demonstrations of police officers being human that I can imagine. And that was all caught on uh, utilities and body-worn camera as well. She's underscoring something that you said. Um, you know, the dangers of police. We talked about the train interaction. And God forbid, uh, really, in today's environment, uh, the dangers that our officers are, are facing, um, the officer down feature, the automation of the camera and the alert in the field and the GPS location of every one of your officers. Again, God forbid, if they were to go down in the line of duty. And we have some recorded saves that I think you're aware of in the country uh, with this system. 
uh, going back to my days as a police chief, I'm getting to a point here where I was really, uh, I felt good about buying that system for, for my agency. And I, I know you have to have uh, some similar feelings here about being able to provide a solution, a technology solution that happens to be a body camera as well, but that, that underscores the importance of knowing where our people are at all times, and then God forbid if they go down the line of duty, uh, the technology to know that they are prone and the alert that, that comes from that. Yeah, so I, I had an experience uh, when I was with Indianapolis. We had an officer who was actually shot and he was down behind a house and it took forever. They did a roll call on the radio. They were chasing a homicide suspect and um, he was right in the hunt. He was chasing this guy and the guy the guy shot him in the head. The officer survived, um, but he had to uh, he had to take a medical retirement. However, he was down behind that house for many minutes. And you know, when, when you have a devastating injury like that, not minutes count, but microseconds count. And by the time his officer, his fellow officers got to him and got a trauma kit to him before the medics arrived, a lot of damage had occurred neurologically to this officer. Um, but you're right. I mean, you hit a, you hit a very, very uh, emotional and sensitive topic and that is when an officer is down and cannot be located because obviously he or she can't communicate you know it, it it gives me great comfort to know that even in the middle of the night we know exactly where every one of our people are and if something horrible were to happen um i i'm at least comforted to know that we have provided them with a tool that will um that will not only alert everyone to the fact that an officer is down, but then give everyone who's logged on, you know, directions to that person. And uh, that that's, uh, that's very comforting. And we found that sometimes the officer down function actually alerts when officers are doing things like searching a vehicle, or if they're for, for whatever legitimate reason, they are like, it kind of down in a prone position and the camera the camera senses that right it goes from goes from this to this for whatever reason so our officers um they actually can request permission to disable the body warrant so if they're getting ready to search a car for example um they can have dispatch disable the officer down function just long enough to allow them to do their legitimate um work and then they can re-enable, or I guess enable, uh, the body-worn function down again. So that has been a big help, um, thanks to utilities development. That wasn't that wasn't originally part of the, the package that you could temporarily disable the officer down function. But so that that uh, reduces those instances where you hear an audible alert that says officer down. Um, and, and usually, I mean, we know because there's not a critical incident in place and, you know, off, officers many times do kind of get in that in that position where their uh, their officer down will, will uh, go off. Chief, complete situational awareness, I think, is what you're describing, knowing where your people are at all times, having a GPS on them because of the body camera and uh, in the interaction between Lawrence, Indiana in Indy Metro, uh, part of that whole, uh, I guess, uh, mutual aid for the Indianapolis metropolitan area. Uh, can you can you describe a little bit about uh, that that interaction of situational awareness, mutual aid, and, and, and seeing where all your people are on one screen from the dial up of a laptop or a, a cell phone even from anywhere in the country including you know maybe your kitchen at two in the morning and knowing uh what resources you need to deploy to a situation based on a live feed or based on a map of knowing what you have locked down and what maybe what you have some challenges with yeah well i you remember being a chief and i know if you're like me even when you're off duty you're monitoring what's going on right so i do that i don't i'm guessing you probably did too you had your radio on at home uh, maybe you had your laptop open uh, I've got my little recliner command center there in my in my family room. So if I happen to be watching TV or whatever, I can have I I stay dialed in as long as I'm awake. And I have had just so many times 
where I will I'll grab my laptop, I will log into a Veil web while I'm listening to um, something occur on my radio, and I'll be able to kind of sit there and see. And I, I don't, I'm not a helicopter chief. I don't get on the radio and tell people what to do or or things like that because I know my dispatch center, the the on duty 911 communications personnel, they're also doing that, and they're looking at you know, uh, at the movement of the little green dot on the map. And uh, so, yeah, it is important that we all get, and all the officers too, they they log on to Avail Web and, and they keep themselves apprised of everyone else's location. Now we have stopped short of using it as a tool for dispatch. And our officers were actually kind of concerned that they would be dispatched based on their location, you know? Mm -hmm. so. And so we wound up not not doing that. You know, we 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 let our officer like and what I mean by that is if two officers happen to be close to a run location, would their location be the criteria by which they are dispatched on the run? And we decided not to do that. We decided to to just make it based on the geography of where the officers are supposed to be assigned and let them disregard other officers if they happen to be closer. But you're right, it is. It's just such a wonderful tool that, that we can know where our officers are at and make tactical strategic decisions based on that. Um, so it, it's, it's just been phenomenal. The fact that it, the, the, the data, the audio and the video uh, uploads instantly, wirelessly, there's no docking stations. Um, you know, the officers almost in real time can view their own videos. Supervisors can view the videos. Um, and that, that kind of brings me to another, uh, uh, I guess, unanticipated benefit that really wasn't first and foremost on my mind. And that mm -hmm. is whenever, one of, whenever a Lawrence police officer engages in uh, a vehicle pursuit, um, whether they use whenever they use force, whether it's a taser or chemical spray or a strike, whenever they have a resistor, whenever they administer naloxone, which is Narcan, whenever they do these high risk, high, you know, life or death kind of things, um, I require my supervisors to generate what we call a supervisory special report. And I require my supervisors to view the videos before they report all the way up the chain of command, all the way to me, on whether or not that incident was in compliance with depart department policy. I don't allow them to submit a supervisory special report unless they have viewed the video. And mm -hmm. it, it's not a big brother type of a thing. It's not George Orwell micromanaging our officers, but it's making sure that they're doing the job, doing it correctly, that they have all the tools that they need, that they're well-trained, and we have actually used our videos uh, as a basis to send officers to some retraining type classes. So uh, to, Chief make, on to that. make them stronger. Chief on that, uh, I think uh, you've really underscored real time, live situational awareness, uh, live feed of the video, you know, things in, in the moment in the system uh, functioning in that realm, but you're, you're kind of transcending here into the back end the audit trail, the after action review, and, and, and how has that changed your agency? I think um, you and I, uh, one time, and we, and we go way back, uh, have talked about the lessons learned and maybe some training opportunities, some de-escalation techniques maybe that are learned in, uh, in today's environment that are needed for today's policing that maybe wouldn't have been underscored as much just a short year, two years ago. Uh, can you can you talk about how how Body Warren has has uh, played a role in that audit trail, and then those possibly de-escalation techniques well, that you yeah, have tried to implement in your agency? You asked how our agency is is has been affected by utility uh, Body Warren. We're safer. I mean, that's that's far and away the best uh, description i could i could say that we're we are a sa our people are safer on this agency we have identified things like you talk about an audit trail whenever there's a a, a body worn video um, generated it's also uh, it saves the map and shows the map on where the officers were at when they were involved and and another benefit is it shows the vehicle speed and direction of travel 
So when we review pursuits, for example, we can see exactly what the speed of that vehicle was at every position along the route of that pursuit. So um, we had a, uh, this was actually on Live PD, we had a, uh, we had a vehicle chase, a Dodge Challenger, a red Dodge Challenger up on the major interstate in Indianapolis on 465. And it was, uh, it was an infraction, which is a, a moving violation. It wasn't somebody wanted, you know, for murder. And this Challenger just took off and it was Friday, uh, about 7 p.m. And the, uh, um, uh, the interstate was busy. Well, this suspect, he got up to 115 miles an hour. And it was a young, it was a young officer and, and he stayed in, he, he was up above 100 miles an hour. And, you know, we, he, the, the chase was terminated, but we used that as a teaching tool. And we talked mm -hmm. about things like, you know, um, uh, operating vehicles with due regard and uh, trying to weigh risk reward. You know, it's risk, everything we do in law enforcement is about uh, mitigating, minimizing risk and, and asking ourselves, what is really important right now? So we were able to use that video with that little breadcrumb trail with all the speeds along the way to maybe, you know, we didn't, we didn't yell at the officer or anything like that. We didn't discipline the officer, but we did use it as a teaching tool and talk about, you know, just what happens to a vehicle at that speed and, and, you know, all the innocent bystanders and all the risk reward parts of the conversation. We, we had another incident as well where we had an officer who, uh, he was on a traffic stop with a gentleman, happened to be a, a, a veteran, a, a, a army veteran. The gentleman was in his 60s. He had committed a minor offense and the officer was clearly agitated. Didn't, didn't use profanity, didn't, there was no name calling, but it was just mm -hmm. not a real friendly interaction. It certainly was not respectful. So we were able to use that video because the guy called and complained that the officer was rude. And I actually agreed. I thought the off, although he didn't violate any specific policy that I could put my finger on, it's just, he just wasn't as service oriented as I wanted him to be. It wasn't good so policing. I'll tell you, yeah. we, we got this officer um, to a, a verbal de-escalation course that was designed to show mm -hmm. officers how to you know, how to calm situations and things you can do and say and use the tone of your voice to, you know, to get people to comply and not be argumentative. There's an emotional intelligence component to it. And I'll tell you, when that officer got back from that training, he was a different guy. He was just more relaxed. And I think he had a better handle on what we expect our interactions to, to be like, you know, and so... so Chief, what were you talking about is the evolution, I think, of policy. So you and I started our careers very, very similarly, uh, time frame wise, uh, back in the early 1990s, where uh, you know you described a, a pursuit. We would chase those people all the way to Kentucky if if they wanted to go that far. Sure. And and you know policy has changed. You know policing has changed. The evolution of the body camera and the interaction with policy and compliance, automation. Uh, I, I think you've underscored a couple things there that the system is smart enough to continue to evolve as policing has exponentially evolved in the last couple of years here. Uh, it doesn't resemble really much of, of what you and I signed up for uh, right. just five, 30 years ago. Uh, it, it's completely different, but it's smarter. and. Um, can, can you give me any any insight into how that a how, how uh, Lawrence PD is better for continuing to evolve with policing with this solution and how it maybe uh, dovetails into what you where you guys are going as a progressive police agency in body warns ability to adapt uh, with with policy compliance for where where we need to be in modern policing. Yeah, so you hit on something very important right there. When we, you and I came on in the 90s, the expectations were different. I think we ask police officers, law enforcement officers, our society is demanding more and more from them. You know, we talk about situations that are tense and uncertain and rapidly evolving and how we can make our officers safer and better and more professional. And I'll tell you, when we first implemented uh, 
the body worn system here in Lawrence, a lot of officers were very skittish, very suspicious that this is going to be used to catch a cop doing something wrong. And it couldn't be further from the truth. We, we, we're catching them doing amazing professional work. And sometimes they don't quite do it right. And then we're not trying to catch them doing something wrong. We're trying to get them the resources and the training that they need to be better public servants. And I think that's where our profession is now going. The vast majority, vast majority of our videos are showing our officers doing a great job. And something else, you know, our officers are aware that, of course, that they're being recorded. So that puts them on a different platform getting out of that car. From the moment they step foot out of that car to interact with somebody, they know that the chief could be reviewing everything I'm about to do, especially if there's a complaint. And I'll tell you, in the city of Lawrence Police Department, not one sustained complaint has been documented on body worn on the uh, utility body worn system. On the other hand, we've had countless uh, false complaints that were discovered to be false because of the system. We've had a lot of people call in and complain, and we inform them that the incident you're talking about was caught on video. Do you wish to continue with this? And many times they, they're just mad. You know, they got a ticket. They maybe got a, their son got arrested, and it's emotional. I understand, but uh, yeah. So, I mean, you you talked earlier about how really this is change. This is a game changer for our profession. You know, and the and you you could go with any any. You could check. I could have. I could have checked a box and gone with some inferior system that requires docking stations that falls that gets knocked off that has no GPS to it that has no automatic uh, activation triggers where I'm saddling my officers with, hey, I have to remember to turn this on. And we've built in so many activation triggers. It's almost really all, all I'm asking, the do, asking them to do is turn it off when the dust settles, when the incident's over, just remember to turn it off. And that's not asking too much of our, of our, guy, of our men and women. So uh, yeah, that's, you talk about trying to be progressive and innovative and use technology smarter, wiser to keep our officers safer. That's exactly what we're doing with this system. And that's why I'm, I'm really, you know, people ask me all the time about utility and I, I tell them these things and no, you know, I, I don't mind doing little programs like this and, and having coffee with you. And because you know what, this is an amazing system that keeps officers safe. And that's what every chief and sheriff and superintendent should strive to do is improve safety, you know, and and improve the professionalism and service that the agency provides. So that's that's you know, people ask me why why do I why do I care? You know, just go do your job, be a chief, you know. But it is important. And you know, you mentioned at the beginning of this, Lawrence was the very first um, agency in the state of Indiana to go with utility. And I can tell you right now, there's there's more than 40 Indiana law enforcement agencies that are now uh, employing utility, you know? And sure. I, don't, I, just, I don't hear, there's no, I don't hear remorse or regret. And I certainly don't have any. In fact, we just signed uh, our, we just about a month ago, we signed our next five year agreement with utility. We've already re-upped. So that in, in my time here, that will be a total of 10 years, uh, you know, by the, and probably sure. well beyond that when the next contract gets gets renewed. So it, it's it's ongoing. It's developing. I love how you guys send out software upgrades, how you upgrade cameras as the technology mm -hmm. improves. This isn't one of those things where, you know, you buy it in the year 2016, like we did, and we're stuck with the 2016 model. You know, we're, we've got, uh, we've been, our cameras have been upgraded at no cost. Our, the software continues to get better. Activation triggers uh, are, are developing. I know you guys have a lot of people on staff I think from the University of uh, Georgia or maybe Georgia Tech, and you've got Tech, tech uh, engineers. That's right. Yeah, you've got some cutting edge, young, smart, um, you know, uh, innovators in your research and development. And I'm I'm glad that we're the beneficiaries of that because every time you guys come up with something new, you push it to us for, for uh, no additional charge. So it's 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 fantastic, and the cameras that we have now. They're as, they're as new and as modern as the year 2021 can offer. 
Um, and they've they've come a long way since since just 2016, you know. So and I look forward to that continuing. Transparency and accountability through policy based recording. Chief David Hoffman of the Lawrence, Indiana Police Department. Thank you for joining us today on Coffee Talk. Very appreciative of, of your time and uh, a lot of lessons learned here today and a lot of talking points. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jason.